how to determine the polarity of a molecule. Now we're not talking about the polarity of a bond like we talked about before, we're talking about the overall molecule. Molecules themselves can be polar or nonpolar. Uh, it's different from the polarity of the bond that we were talking about in these uh, the polarity of the molecule will cause the molecule to have different properties. So, in order for a molecule to be polar, you must have two things be true about it. First of all, the bonds within the molecule must be polar, so a nonpolar bond cannot produce a polar molecule. Uh, and also, the bonds that are polar bonds must not cancel each other out geometrically. Now, that may not make a lot of sense, but as we do some examples, it will begin to. So how do bonds cancel out? What do we mean by canceling out? Well, it has to do with this special thing called a dipole. So a dipole exists anytime you have a polar bond. So here's an example of a polar bond, carbon with fluorine, which has a higher electronegativity. Well, of course, fluorine does. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity of all the nonmetals or of all the elements, rather, and uh, so fluorine is going to have a higher electronegativity. So when we draw that dipole, here's how we draw it. We draw it as an arrow, an arrow that is pointing towards the more electronegative or atom. So fluorine is more electronegative, so the arrow is pointing towards the fluorine, and the little plus on the other end indicates that that end of the bond is a little more positive because the fluorine is sort of winning. Remember, in the middle here, we have electrons that are being fought over. And if fluorine's winning, the electrons are on this side. This ends a little bit negative. This ends a little bit positive. So that's how we draw a dipole. Now, uh, we drew that dipole really big because fluorine beats carbon by quite a bit, fluorine being the most electronegative atom. So we call that arrow that we just drew a dipole. Now. What if we had this bond, C with Br? Well, Br is also more electronegative than carbon, uh, but not as much as fluorine, so it should still win. The dipole should still point towards bromine, but not as big. It should draw a smaller arrow, so we have a different size arrow here indicating that the dipole, the difference in pole, is not as big. If this were a tug of war, fluorine would be winning by more than bromine would be winning. So, in order for a polar bond to geometrically cancel, their dipoles must both, A, be the same size. In other words, if we had this uh, a CF versus a CBR, they couldn't cancel each other out because those dipoles aren't the same size. In other words, the bond must be between the same two elements, and they must work exactly opposite each other. So, uh, none of this makes a whole lot of sense until you actually start to see it. Uh, explained, but uh, here's a little hint. If there are lone pairs around the center atom, they usually don't cancel each other out. If, so lone pairs are an indication that they're probably not going to cancel each other out. So uh, let's do some examples here to make sense of all this. So first of all, we have water, H2O, and uh, we know that the shape is bent line from what we've already learned. Um, but because of the shape of water, Oxygen, being more electronegative, is going to have the dipole pointing towards it. Um, this is the oxygen, this is the hydrogen. And uh, so you're going to have a dipole towards the oxygen. Well, here we have uh, this other bond over here. This hydrogen-oxygen bond is also going to be pointing towards the oxygen. And if you'll notice, if we just kind of redraw that over here, these two arrows are not working against each other. They're both going to the left, but they're also both going up. So they're working together in the up direction. And so these are not going to cancel. And remember that uh, we needed them to not cancel to be a polar bond. So this is a polar bond for this example. For the next example, we're going to use carbon dioxide, and in carbon dioxide you'll notice it's a linear, and that's going to change our answer quite a bit versus the water example we just did. First of all, this is carbon, this is oxygen. Carbon being less electronegative than oxygen, we're going to have a dipole this direction, 
but we're also going to have exactly the same uh, dipole in exactly the opposite direction, which means that these two are exactly going to cancel each other out. It's almost as though it's a tug of war that's going this way and this way in exactly the same amount. And so these are geometrically going to cancel each other out. And so this would be nonpolar. We would say that those dipoles have canceled one another. So there's an example uh, of water where the, uh, the dipoles are not canceling one another uh, versus the uh, carbon dioxide where they are. One thing I forgot to mention a minute ago was if we do the Lewis structure for water, you'll notice that water has these lone pairs on the center atom. That was a key I said. Lone pairs usually, not always, but the vast majority of the time are going to, oop, my board's not oriented properly, are going to indicate a polar molecule. Whereas carbon dioxide, if we do the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide, uh, the center atom there, the carbon, does not have any lone pairs, and so we might guess nonpolar. So uh, here's another example, ammonia, NH3. Um, if we do the Lewis structure for ammonia, it's going to look like that. And so you might guess with the lone pair that it's going to be polar. So let's see if that's correct. Well, here's the structure up here. We have a trigonal pyramid. Uh, you have the dipole going towards the center, towards the center, towards the center. Uh, this is a trigonal pyramid. So it sort of looks like they're all pointing towards the center. But notice that this is a trigonal pyramid. So uh, all of our dipoles are being directed toward nitrogen, but they're also being directed up. So while they're all inward, they're sort of canceling inward, but they're all going up as well. There's nothing down to cancel the, the up. So there is a net dipole. These are not all canceling each other, and this would be polar, which is what we guessed based on the lone pair. And so that was correct. I tried to circle the lone pair there, but my board's not oriented at the moment. So finally, uh, the last example is CHCl3. Here's an example. If you draw the Lewis structure, there are no lone pairs. Uh, you have to trust me, or you can go ahead and do it yourself to convince yourself of that fact. But there are no lone pairs around the center atom if you draw this. And so you might guess that it's nonpolar. However, notice that um, the dipoles on the H's are going towards the center, uh, and uh, they should all cancel each other out with this Cl at the top. But remember, Cl has a different electronegativity than H, and Cl is actually going to have a dipole up. And so there's up, 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 up. There's nothing going down, so there's no cancellation. So this does have a net dipole, uh, and so this would be a polar molecule. This molecule is polar because uh, it satisfies this second part here. If you have trouble figuring all this out, look for two things. Two things you can look for to let you know that it's probably polar. First, look for any lone pairs on the center atom. Second, uh, look for bonds on the center atom between two different elements. You look back here, we have carbon in the middle that's bonded to hydrogen, but it's also bonded to chlorine, two different atoms, and that gives us a pretty good indication that it's probably going to be polar which it is.